And I was told I was going to speak for 20 minutes all my life. I've not spoken less than eight hours at a stretch. So my brain went into a shock on how to compress and compound all I have to say in 20 minutes. So if I finish in 20 minutes, it's a miracle. I want you to clap for God for doing that for me. <laughs> so I don't even want to know what to talk about. And, but when I walked into the hall, I knew what my topic was going to be. When I saw those young people right there sitting by this by my side. What school is that again? Because I remember when I was a little child, born one year, six months after I was born, and I had polio. And that was the definition of my life. A young person in a country in Nigeria, how would you survive, let alone succeed, with having to deal with physical challenges? So today, I'm going to talk about Mind mastery, one of the reasons why I'm able to make success out of my life, and I hope it helps those young children over there. But first, how would you envision someone like this? Um, a grown man with muscles, with capacities in every way, but yet sells plantain chip. It means that. The unfortunate thing about the brain is it doesn't work until it's developed. In other words, you could be grown 30 years or 35 years and still live a life below your capacity. So if you look at this picture right now, you can see that's me before the polio. Bright, young man, full of energy, hoping to become successful, and then polio hits. When my father retired back from Aba, back to my village, and we didn't have a car, my younger brothers were going to school. They have to trek long distances to where they were to go to school, and I couldn't do that. So every morning when my brothers left for school, I would feel so terrible, and what I could do was one of the days, as they woke up in the morning, I took the school uniform and put it inside the water so nobody goes to school. You didn't clap for me for that. And guess what? Yet, I didn't go to school. So stopping other people from moving forward will make you move forward. So what I did, every morning when they decide to go to school, I would dress up as I'm going to school and follow them, and I would stop at the gate of my house, and they would continue to school, and I won't come into the house until they come back and meet me at the gate, and I will come back with them. So every single day, I was persistent, I was consistent, I would always dress up, always dress up, and follow them to, to the gate. So one day, somebody stopped by and said, young man, I see you every day in front of your gate, and you're always crying. I said, what is the problem? I said, I wanted to go to school. So I pointed towards my school, and the man felt so passionate, walked into the house, talked to my daddy, and said to my dad that my path to school was on his path to his job. Could you take the liberty to take me to school? My dad said yes. You know what I found out? Anytime you stand at the gate of your destiny, a helper will come. <laughs> now, that was me right there. And taking me to school became a vision for that man. Because sometimes people's dream is to help you. But what if you're not at the gate? What if you're not always determined to show up where you can be seen? So that was how I went to primary school. And then it continued, my journey continued like that. People would make mockery of me, looking at me, I'm walking some kind of way. So in secondary school, which was in this town, matter of fact, Holy Ghost College Oweri, and my, I got admission to Holy Ghost College Oweri somewhere around the axis, and my guardian was taking me to the boarding house. As he was walking into the school premises, we passed different hostels. I see young children playing football, full of life. Everybody's excited. So my uncle, my, my guardian was passing these people and was getting to a particular hostel. Everybody looked like disabled. So it was a place where they're blind, deaf, and dumb, crippled. And my guardian was going towards that area. I'm like, I'm looking at my guardian. I hope you're not going to this place because I am not disabled. And I found that my uncle, my guardian was blind because he could not see my potential. <laughs> so I left my guardian there where he belonged and went back to the hostel where everybody was okay. So when I started staying in, this, in the hostel where people were playing football, dancing, music, doing all manner of things, my spirit was alive again. And then that's when the problem started. 
when it was time to go to take a shower at night, in the morning before we go to school, you have to take the bucket and get to the bathroom. And then it was obvious I could not do that. And my friends then would help me take the bucket and create water for me and take me to the bathroom. So they did that a couple of times. Each time we come to the hostel and we're talking about an ideas and I say something, they would ask me to shut up. I said, why? I said, because they took the water to the hostel. I'm like, I didn't ask you to do that for me. You know what I found out? Anytime people do service for you, even though you didn't ask for it, you are indebted. So I said, okay, I see why. So the laws of exchange says that value must leave you before you can deserve value back. So right there and then, I began to think, mind mastery is the cultural wealth. I began to think, what can I do to balance the equation? You remember those days when you come to the hostel, you come with provisions like milk, cabin biscuit, gary, groundnut, all manner of things we used to come back to school. So what I do, I did, I wouldn't finish my provisions, I would keep them. So each time someone helps me to take my bucket of water to the bathroom, I would give him a cup of uh, gary or something. So they now knew that I'm a giver, that each time people take my bucket of water to the bathroom, they'll get something for me. Every morning, 10 guys will come and struggle on who to take my stuff to the bathroom. <laughs> it was crazy. Now, what does it mean? It means that you can always find a way to make up for what you don't have. So what happens here is this. Then we had a inter-house sports in Hulagos College. We had Maria Sumta, John Bosco Hostel, and St. Thomas, and so many of the other hostels. During the inter-house sports, because I'm a very, you know, um, someone that is very creative all the time, and matter of fact, my nickname in secondary school was the Million Dollar Man. I've always wanted to be a rich man against what everybody says. So my friends in school knew I'm a very stubborn person because if you tell me no, that's when I start. So at that time, during the inter-house sports, I decided to be the goalkeeper of my hostel. And look at me, I could not work. That time I had no crutches, I was limping. And they, talk, they tried to talk to me out of it. I said, if I don't play the football, nobody plays football. So when we got into the field, guess what, someone just scored us? They scored us 10-0, clap for me. 10-0. So what happened was, the one that got me really thinking was the 10th goal before the time, I would be on one part of the goalpost. I'll be sitting there. Remember, as they are dribbling the ball, my mind is calculating the angles. So if you're going to shoot the ball that way, I have already calculated in my mind how I'm going to run to catch it. But as my mind has finished the calculation, my leg will say, you can't run. You should run this side. So I was really worried. Then the one that really got me thinking was one of the strikers got into the 18-yard box. Because I could not run, he sat down. Instead of trying to shoot the ball, he sat down and used his bum bum to put the ball in the net. That was insulting. At that point in time, I knew I could not compete physically. Guess what I did? I left the pitch and became the coach. I didn't leave football. So I designed the game with my brain. I said, John, you play seven. James, you play, you play nine. Kingsley, you play two. When I designed the game, we started winning. I want to ask you a question. Who do you think shouted first when my team scored my game? It was me. You know what I found out? What you lose physically, you can make up mentally. From that day on, everything about my life changed strategically. Now, I'm going to share something very quickly with you right here and on TEDx. Yeah. So I went on to the university, and guess what? I graduated from Imo State University here in a way as well. And one of the days I was driving my car on Wedra Road. As I was driving, but before that, I was asking questions. Why would out of nine children, I'll be the one that will have polio? I talked to my mom about it. My mom tried to give me all the wonderful sermon of how my sickness turned my father and my mother closer to God. I said, Mom, it doesn't explain why I had to be the one. Until I met the place in the Bible in John chapter 9, when the disciples asked Jesus, what is the sin of the person who was born blind? 
He said, it's not the, son, the fault of the father, not the, not the fault of the mother, but, but the glory of God will remain manifest in his time. So I see that, I, oh God. So which means, what God wants to show is to use me as an example to show you that I am a symbol of strength. That even if they cut your hands, cut your legs, cut your eyes, you still have the capacity to be as powerful as you can be. So right then, I was driving into Wedra Road. As I was driving, a brand new car was coming in front of me. And that car had a flat tire. The back tire of the car busted. Guess what happened? My man said, watch. It's like a movie playing. As the car was coming, the driver was having issue trying to control the car, so he pulled over by the shoulder of the road. Guess what? The owner of the car came out of the car and went to the back of the car and brought out the spare tire of the car from the car. Remember, the car is brand new. And I'm thinking in my head, if man, in his little wisdom, can make a brand new car, and while the car is still brand new in the factory, they put a spare, knowing there's a possibility of tear and wear and bust. Don't you think that God, in his infinite wisdom, has put a spare ability? Should they cut your hand? Should they cut your leg? Should they take your eyes? But guess what happened? The spare is not outside. The spare is on the inside. So which means when something happens to me, I need to take myself out of the situation. I'm going to go into myself and develop the next alternative. <laughs> oh my goodness, you didn't hear me. That's when I found, I tried as much as possible to make up physically what I lost. So I started studying, I began to read, I began to read as an alternative. I began to study to understand how things work as an alternative. But I found the more I study, the more I figure out the answers of things. And those who have legs and don't study come to work for me. So what I thought was alternative was the main event. Ladies and gentlemen, I know until your mind creates the life you want, your life cannot live it. So what I found swell, and that is how my journey started, ladies and gentlemen. And you can see this again. Now this is doing NYSE. When I got to the camp, they told me you have a physical challenge. The, the trick about this is this. Most people will always see me based on what they cannot see. They see my physical structure, they think that I'm disabled. When my mind sees me as a complete human being, I have never seen the crutches. To today, you are the one that sees the crutches. I see myself as a complete human being who can do and has always done what I wanted. I have created multiple companies, generated millions of dollars, traveled around the world, and yet you're so blind, yet you cannot see what I'm made of. So I forgive you for that anyways. So right now, and that's why sometimes when I'm traveling around the world, I'm going to speak anywhere. When I walk up this stage with my crutches or wheelchair, people say, yeah, yeah. And when I get up this stage and start speaking, they have respect for me. And I'll tell you this, when people see your circumstances, they're going to have sympathy. When they see your values, they're going to have respect. Respect commands opportunities for you. Okay? So right here, during the NYC camp at Umudi, I've forgotten the place, actually, we got to the camp. I was the only guy on crutches. And the commandant said, well, you can't be here. I said, you must be blind not to see what I can do. So what are you going to do? I said, well, when they go for endurance straight, who's going to take care of the things they kept behind? It's got to be me. And you don't need legs for that, do you? You know, so there's always a place for you regardless of what life deals for you, okay? And then I move on right here. And as a matter of fact, some event happened at NYAC that was so incredible. I was the person that was advocating for the rights of the core members in the camp because we were treated so badly. But the only person they could trust for nonviolence was the man on crutches. So you see, crutches also makes you different, makes you better. You know, always find a place for yourself. <laughs> so right here at the Okibuero Junction, I met this young man who was always walking hard physically. This man right here had polio. This young man right here has polio, and he was always at the construction site trying to make ends meet. So one day, I saw him on his cobbler shop where he was making shoes. 
I walked up to him. If you look at his leg, he had polio. If you look at me, I had polio. So two of us, who is disabled? <laughs> and right there at he was, making shoes in a shabby shop. And I told him that you, you cannot be confined to this place. You can do much more. And I asked him, why don't you have a better shop? He said he has no money. I went to the sawmill at Oboshi here. I met those who sell planks. I said, do you have extra plank that you don't use? They said yes. I said, can I have them? They gave it to me. I found carpenters who were there who had no time to, on Saturdays. They said, when, what, which part of the day don't you have job to do? They said, Saturdays. I said, can you volunteer your time for me? He said, yes. So I got all the people who can help me build a shop, and I didn't pay one dime. So I brought them here, and then I made this shop for this guy free of charge without spending a dime. So we, we built this, I built this for him. Now, at the time, Mrs. Rose Menike was the commissioner for women affairs. So when I got to the women affairs with my crutches, I, told, I walked into the commissioner's office. As soon as she saw me, she said, oh God, all these people again with disability coming to beg. I said, mommy, no, this time I've come to give you a gift. She said, what is the gift? I said, I've built a shop for a cobbler. And that service falls under the Women Affairs Commission project. I want to give you that gift to say your commission did that. The woman turned around and said, see, I talk about great people like you. You see, when you see wonderful people, he made a phone call and called IBC, called the governor, called all the people in the state to come and see a great man. In other words, it's value that adds, that adds and gives you space to be relevant. Right there, we went around the city of Imo State and we brought all the people that were blind, crippled, deaf and dumb. And this was a, a blind man. And when he was making a speech about the project, he said that this particular piece of project is a beautiful one. I wonder how he saw it. In other words, kindness is an art even the blind can see. In other words, what happened was that day was that man was handed over that particular project. Go to the next, please. So this young man received, no, no, go back, go back, go back, go back, sir, go back, sir, go back, sir, go back, sir. Okay, so that was how this man received his stuff right there at the Imo State University Junction. You know what I found out? Our mind creates our life. If you don't like the life you live today, don't change it. It's too late. But you can change the life you live by changing the mind you have. Your mind is a factory that creates the life that you want. That's what I wanted to take home today. And I went ahead after I left the university and traveled to the United States and came back, and it's then it's been wonderful. I want you to see this young man right here and whom polio tend to want to stop, but he only got me the capacity to show you today, everybody listening to me, that I'm not a symbol of weakness, I'm a symbol of strength. I am that man that you remember, and you know that if they cut your limbs, cut your legs, take out all your eyes, you still have the central power to create the, the life you want. And I'll leave you with this quote. I'll leave you with this quote. Let's read it together. Your mind can take you to places your legs can't. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity. I love you.